us. We've got a great webinar, great educational activity for you today. And I think most importantly, I want you to know that I, and I know all of my colleagues on the panel, appreciate everything that each of you do every day to take, help us take care of patients. It's really, really important after all that is our goal. As you can see, I'm an emeritus professor of cardiology at Emory. I'm also the past president of the ASE. I've spent 45 years of my life in the echo world uh, and it enhanced me as a clinician. So we're gonna talk about the power of ultrasound and I'm also the chief medical officer of Caption Health. We're gonna to try to do this quickly today uh, in this one hour, but there's great information you're gonna get. I'm gonna highlight how COVID has not only changed our society, but is really changing healthcare and discuss the new technology that's gonna be enabled by these changes and it will enable the changes. And then uh, my colleagues on the panel have got great cases for you that look at the power of POCUS, especially AI enabled POCUS to really democratize the way po point of care ultrasound plays a role. Uh, before I introduce Pat, I failed to mention that we have a Q and A capabilities. You can ask a question down at the bottom. I think some of the panelists are gonna try to answer those as we, as we uh, do that. We're gonna, we have a packed program, but we may get to some of your questions. If not all, then we'll individually respond to you. So let me introduce our panelists. Dr. Pat McCarthy is a good friend. He's a world-class surgeon. Pat, I can say that because you are. But most importantly, he's ex executive director of the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute at Northwestern, vice president of their medical group and chief of the division of cardiac surgery. And Pat's been not only an innovator in surgery, but in artificial intelligence. And he'll tell you a little bit about that, really fun. Next is Rohan Panachamiya. Rohan uh, was with us on an earlier webinar. Rohan was in the middle of the uh, tsunami in the, in the spring when New York City was under the assault. Uh, the, he's an assistant professor of anesthesiology and critical care medicine, an early adopter of how POCUS really plays an incredible role in the COVID environment, and now he's branching out into pre-op and other areas. Jay Heidecker is a, a colleague, he's a pulmonologist and a critical care specialist, uh, about an hour west of me or an hour and a half west of me from Atlanta. Jay, Jay is in Birmingham, Alabama at St. Vincent's, uh, a great hospital. And Jay's gonna really highlight how they've empowered their uh, colleagues in the ICUs and the CCUs to use this technology. Judy Chang is an assistant professor of, in neurology at Weill Cornell. Judy's active and uh, running the neuro uh, ICU and has really interesting insights into how this technology can be used in the neuro, neuro ICU units and really how her neurology co colleagues and neurointensivists around the country and around the world are really focusing in on POCUS. And finally, Shriek. Shriek, your last name begins with a B, so I'm sure you're used to being introduced last in this environment. You certainly are not last. Uh, by any means, those of you that have, have any, that read literature, read our academic literature, know Shriek's name well. But besides being a prolific investigator and clinician, he's also the medical director of the Duke uh, Echo Lab and Associate Director of the Healthcare Transformation. Shreve's gonna take us into the outpatient world, look at value-based care. So we have a packed program and here we are today. Uh, it's almost eight months, it was a little over eight months from when the really the COVID uh, uh, pandemic hit our shores. We have 11.6 million Americans infected now, really tragic number. Uh, and there's no doubt that COVID has not only uh, produced a new reality in our society, but a dramatic new reality in healthcare on how we're gonna deliver care, where we're gonna deliver care, who's gonna deliver that care. And there are really four things that I think the, the COVID reality will, will change in healthcare. We saw and have seen, and those of us that have been in critical care areas forever have known the incredible role that our non-physician providers play in giving care. But COVID has really highlighted the critical role that they do, the APPs, the RNs, PAs. And you're gonna see how they've been enabled with POCUS and AI-enabled POCUS to be able to acquire diagnostic images that lead to changes in management uh, with interpretation by their colleagues in cardiology and other areas. Uh, we're, second thing we're gonna see is care is moving out of the hospital. Uh, we saw that with COVID for various, for obvious reasons, but we're gonna see more care in outlying clinics and specialty clinics, maybe in specialty nursing facilities and home healthcare 
I think in my lifetime is going to have a dramatic increase and POCUS is going to play a role in there as will different providers. And finally, telehealth was dramatic during COVID. Uh, it's going to continue to do that and will enable point of care ultrasound systems that are done uh, out of hospital to be viewed in hospital or wherever they are uh, could be viewed and home health care and, and rise of AI enabled POCUS is gonna be enabled by, by that. Just quickly, uh, we've known for a long time, and I've known since really the, the 70s when I first was fortunate to be in, in the early developments of 2D Echo, the incredible power of just getting a few views for being able to sort of figure out what's going on with people, what's their diagnosis and aid in, in directing management. And POCUS is a very powerful diagnostic tool where a few focus views can really accelerate uh, clinical decision and making timely decisions. Colleagues such as Bill Zogby, a good friend, past president of the ASE and ACC, Susan Wiggers, also past president of the ASE, and Catherine Otto have all writ written about POCUS's power. Catherine has even um, sort of looked into the future and talked how about artificial intelligence will play such a role. So POCUS is really, really gonna be important in the future. We all know that and the panelists certainly know that. The ASC has uh, highlighted the, the, the value of POCUS with not only papers and great documents, but lots of webinars. If you look in the lower left, there are really four or five views you'd get for ECHO that would tell you a lot of information about LV size and function, RV size and function, pericardial valves, and then getting a, a four or five lung ultrasound views will tell you about the pulmonary status. And the thing that's really important and we've learned is the incredible prognostic capabilities of ECHO during the COVID. The colleagues in New York just had a great paper out uh, in Jack where they showed that, that uh, RV dysfunction uh, is, is certainly as Rohan and Jade know and have recognized probably due to multiple PEs or sizable PEs and RV dysfunction really denote a population at high risk of complications and mortality. So the power of POCUS in COVID has been shown and that power is gonna be distributed. Uh, when we think about uh, POCUS being done in a hospital or an outpatient clinic, if you could hook it up to the QPAC, uh, uh, I mean, to the PAC system or your Q pathway, you know that you can get colleagues that are more experienced in interpretation to take a look at it. AI is going to be able to enable people uh, wherever they are with uh, POCUS to be able to acquire uh, good and diagnostic quality views. And then with some AI interpretation that you can begin to get preliminary diagnoses or information say about EF. But these, view, these studies can also be viewed by colleagues via telehealth. So it's a tremendous power. And as I said, I think home health care is gonna be really, really important. So at Caption Health, by having this AI enabled ability to uh, take somebody who's not proficient in ultrasound, say a nurse who's never been exposed to it or a PA, or even one of your colleagues who's not had formal training, that they could be able with guidance to be able to acquire images. There's quality on uh, uh, information on those images. And then those images can be used to quickly uh, aid in determination of diagnosis and lead toward management. You're going to see that. The particular images that we're showing are available on this Terrason 3200T plus. So with that overview, I wanna to go to Pat. And uh, Pat, uh, as I mentioned, is really a, a, is not only a, an innovator in cardiac surgery, but Pat has uh, really developed a, a unique AI focus and has basically a center for artificial intelligence and cardiovascular disease through a very generous uh, uh, Grant. So, Pat, why don't you take it away? Hope you're not muted, Pat. Pat, Pat. I mean, Pat doesn't doesn't have any disclosures that is uh, pertinent to this. I don't know if we lost Pat. If we um, if we lost Pat, if somebody can, if one of you can tell me, then we'll um, we can go on to. Um, Rohan's presentation. Can it? Can any of you? Yeah, I would move forward, Randy, for now. Okay. Kind of get okay. okay. So we'll come back to Pat in a minute. You know, he's got some interesting stuff. I'm going to steal his his uh, his summary. Is that 
artificial intelligence and medicine and cardiovascular medicine is, is here. It's important that we train future leaders. Uh, it has helped and will continue to enhance our management, not only in COVID, but in other areas. And that democratizing cardiac screening technologies across all of their hospitals and systems really is improving their care. So let's go to Rohan. Rohan, as I mentioned, was with us at our earlier, uh, at our earlier uh, webinar. Rohan is an early uh, advocate for using uh, caption in his COVID units had 240 patients at any one time on ventilators. And Rohan's going to take us through what he's learned and experience uh, at Weill Cornell. So Rohan, good to see you again. Great. Thanks, Randy, for the kind introduction. Um, next slide, please. So as you know, New York City was the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic here in the U.S. from mid-March through May. And at the time we faced incredible challenges in providing care to over 200 critically ill, mechanically ventilated COVID-19 patients in various clinical settings, including operating rooms and recovery rooms that were transformed into pop-up ICUs. Next slide, please. Recognizing the clinical value of cardiac focus, um, we quickly developed and applied a protocol to screen, diagnose, and monitor COVID-19 associated cardiovascular abnormalities. We performed a baseline cardiac focus exam consisting of five standard cardiac views and IVC long axis, then qualitatively assessed the images for cardiac structure and function. The baseline exam served as a comparison study if we had to perform a repeat focused cardiac ultrasound to evaluate a change in a patient's uh, condition clinical status. Next slide, please. Am I going forward? This, yeah. uh, Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, perfect, Ryan. thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. So this imaging strategy um, worked well for us up until early April when the number of uh, critically ill COVID cases uh, ballooned to 50 patients in, in our pop-up ICU, OR ICU, PACU ICU. Um, there were not enough of uh, skilled POCUS users to perform and, and interpret um, cardiac ultrasound exams. Um, so we made it our mission to provide the benefits of POCUS-guided individualized care on a larger scale than we otherwise um, uh, thought possible. And this is when we leverage the capabilities of uh, the Caption AI system to empower and enable redeployed anesthesiology providers, uh, most with little to no POCUS experience to acquire diagnostic quality cardiac ultrasound images for interpretation by a critical care physician or cardiologist. Uh, next slide, please. The novice users, anesthesiology attendings, anesthesiology residents, nurse anesthetists did clinically indicated cardiac focus exams on 26 out of uh, 50 patients in our OR um, PACU um, pop-up ICU. The most common indication for cardiac focus was uh, hypotension. And image quality of the exams was usually sufficient to make a diagnosis. We only had to get um, comprehensive TTE exams on, on three patients. Next slide, please. Uh, ultrasound images uh, captured by um, these novice users uh, allowed assessment of LV size and function, RV size and function, and IVC size and respirophasic um, variability in almost uh, all cases. Uh, but most importantly, cardiac focus uh, changed or influenced clinical management. Uh, for example, initiating disease specific therapies, titration of vasopressors, volume status assessment in at least 70% of cases, which is, uh, which is mind blowing. Next slide, please. Um, so I have a case to present, um, and this 
And these images were uh, acquired by, by a nurse anesthetist, um, the patient, a 53 years old woman with a history of diabetes, uh, presented to our emergency room with a three days history of altered mental status. Uh, she was hypotensive and tachycardic, uh, tested positive for COVID-19. The ER gave her several liters of fluid, started a vasopressor drip, uh, transferred care to us in, in, in the ORICU. And one of my nurse anesthetists uh, did a focused uh, TTE, which showed uh, a dilated LV a severely re with severely reduced systolic function. Uh, moderately uh, dilated RV with decreased function. So putting the clinical picture together, you know, the woman's low output shock state was uh, cardiogenic in origin. And uh, with this, uh, with the findings um, gained from, from, from doing the echo exam, um, we um, uh, aggressively diureased her, um, started low dose milrinone and her uh, clinical exam and, and numbers improved. Right. Next slide, please. Uh, another case, um, a relatively healthy 56 years old woman who uh, became critically ill from COVID-19 and ended up uh, intubated and mechanically ventilated. Um, on hospital day three, our pop-up ICU, she had uh, escalating vasopressor requirements, um, worsening metabolic and respiratory acidosis and decreased her output. A pain physician redeployed as COVID physician did a limited TTE on this patient, which showed a moderately dilated RV with reduced uh, function and uh, interventricular septal flattening, uh, relatively underfilled uh, LV. So with this information, we started her on a uh, milrinone um, fusion, uh, inhaled nitric oxide, transitioned care to the cardiac ICU, got her heart failure specialist on board, where, um, and in the cardiac ICU, she was continued on, on the same therapies. Uh, fortunately, she survived and walked out of the hospital two and a half months later. That's, yeah, it's, those are amazing cases. I mean, I, 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 when I see a pain physician doing this, this echo, I, you know, it, it does show that the power that if you have this guidance system enabled AI enabled that uh, you can get it. The other thing, Shriek, that strikes me, and I'm sure uh, you, you'd make the same comment, is we know with POCUS you don't need 35 views. You need, uh, you know, a series of views that allow you to uh, evaluate LV, RV, size, pericardial valves. Uh, Shriek and Jay, is, and I know, Jay, you're going to present some cases, but that's been your experience as well? Yeah, absolutely, Randy. I think, you know, um, the idea is here is to do a focused exam, right? There's a clinical scenario with a clinical question, and we really don't need 50 or 100 pictures to, to answer those things. Um, and, and that's really, you know, part of the power is the guidance. And of course, um, just in a few views, being able to answer these critical questions. Great. Jay, I'm going to come to you in just a second. Um, in fact, I'm going to come to you faster than just in a second. So Rohan, this is good. You're going to come back in a minute. I know you know, you all have really at, at Cornell really did grab the technology and it aided, I think, not only in diagnosis, but aided your management, as you showed tremendously. You'll come back and talk to us about using it in pre-op and post-op pack use and things like that. I don't know whether Pat's, Pat came back and I don't know whether he left again, but we'll get, we'll get to <laughs> Pat when he comes back in a minute. But uh, next, let's go to, to Jay. Jay, as I mentioned, is a pulmonologist and a critical care physician at St. Vincent in Birmingham. And, and Jay also has really an interesting uh, uh, information and, and cases in using this technology uh, in Birmingham. So Jay, good to see you. Thank you. Um, it's good to see you and good to talk with everyone. Uh, Randy mentioned I'm a, a pulmonary critical care physician uh, in a community-based hospital uh, practicing for 15 years. Um, my interest in ultrasound started actually in training at MUSC with uh, Peter Dolkin, uh, who has been a long time uh, who care ultrasonographer. Um, he's now in uh, New York, I believe, uh, but uh, I appreciate his, his guidance. Uh, at any rate, uh, I practice in a uh, at St. Vincent's Hospital, where a, a fully uh, staffed uh, services, community-based hospital in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, 
we've got, I would call us a moderate sized hospital, uh, hospital system of, of five um, hospitals serving four counties. Um, we have four ICUs with two of those being medical ICU, 21 bed total. Uh, we will, I'm sure, be approaching our, our COVID uh, saturation again, uh, peak last surge. Uh, we had 20 COVID ICU patients, and that included uh, where we cannibalized part of SI2 and into uh, a COVID ICU. Um, and as I mentioned, we have we offer the full range of services, including ECMO, but I had to say we have not had uh, success in our uh, ECMO patients. Uh, so uh, we got, as I said, two medical ICUs we uh, cover, and we've got uh, nurse practitioners. Uh, we don't have so our practitioners are, are uh, really our front line, with, with the attending are the front line, uh, providers in each of the two ICUs. There's one nurse practitioner in one of the medical ICUs and uh, one in the other with one physician then uh, managing both the uh, ICUs. Uh, uh, our team here of our uh, nurse practitioners, um, um, one of whom was sick and didn't uh, make the photo, but uh, um, our practitioners uh, are very good clinicians. They uh, um, didn't have uh, any, the only ultrasound experience they had was some minimal experience uh, through uh, very uh, informal uh, sessions with me about some focused uh, ultrasound, uh, lung ultrasound, and some of the findings. Uh, uh, the main we use in uh, uh, assessment of shock and um, and fluid resuscitation, the falls protocol, and then acute respiratory failure, blue protocol, uh, through uh, Daniel Lichtenstein's uh, uh, guidance uh, or his uh, the guidance from his papers, which uh, briefly, if you're familiar with the blue protocol, it's, uh, you know, you're essentially using uh, lung ultrasound findings, uh, the artifact that uh, Randy showed on initial screen, uh, normal A lines, uh, abnormal B lines, or, and findings of lung sliding or lack there to help pneumothorax in patients with severe respiratory failure, people presenting either to the ER or on a rapid response, so their physiology is accentuated. Uh, using lung ultrasound and then limited cardiac views, a subcostal view, perhaps a, an apical four-chamber view to assess for uh, large pathology uh, you find a bunch of B lines suggesting pulmonary edema, you see systolic dysfunction, and there's your answer. You find normal A lines, but a dated right trickle, and you probably have a pulmonary embolus. So we use the, that uh, blue protocol, and then the false protocol is using the same technology, but then uh, fluid resuscitating until you, using the same technology to find large pathology, and then fluid resuscitate until you hit B lines, and then you're in uh, pure distributive shock in your septic patient. So, Joe, so you got, you got two, yeah, two cases here. So take us through these because they're yep. quite interesting. So, so the first case is a 50-year-old uh, patient who presents to the ER, sort of not specifically, but with encephalopathy shock and leukocytosis, appropriately received three liters of fluid, but still remained on uh, norepinephrine and vipressin. Um, he ultimately developed respiratory failure that required intubation. Before he was intubated, he was on a high flow cannula and his airway looked like uh, diffuse pulmonary edema or ARDS. He was transferred to the ICU and it was at that point then that uh, one of our practitioners did this um, goal directed echo. And you can see on the peristernal uh, views uh, what appears to be very normal systonk, which is I reiterated on the uh, short axis views. Uh, she did this as part of the uh, the, the whole call, part of the, trying to get good apical two chamber view, which I think is a oftentimes a hard thing to do. But I think she got pretty good views there too, and then got IVC 
a view which uh, in this spontaneously breathing patient with what appears to be pulmonary edema has a highly collapsible uh, IVC. And so additional crystalloid was given in the ICU, two more liters actually, uh, before the IVC you know, plumped. Uh, there were no changes really uh, in oxygenation during that and the patient was able to come off of uh, vasopressin and norepinephrine. Was, uh, right, and it, you know, and as we were as we were talking earlier, Shriek and I uh, know Rowan uh, commented and talked about you've got you know adequate views of and uh, good views and parasternal and so apicals are tough sometimes, but your IVC, so you got the answers. Tell about this mm -hmm. patient again, and that was performed by one of your nurse practitioners with the guidance mm -hmm. game models. Yep, absolutely. The second patient is a. Uh, in the COVID unit, this is a different situation where the patient has pneumonitis and has been on um, a high flow cannula as well um, and has a very marginal option status. She's been in the ICU for 10 days and has had ongoing diuresis and attempts to uh, improve oxygenation, but despite that, X is getting worse. So, once again, uh, one of our uh, uh, nurse practitioners did uh, this first examination and uh, the B lines were consistent with uh, COVID pneumonitis or, uh, or other uh, pneumonitis. Uh, but when you look at these views, the parasternal long and short axis views, uh, once again, like the prior case, uh, show once again, systolic function, uh, uh, and then when we get to the IVC view, like the previous case, one has an IVC uh, that's small, quite variable uh, with respiration, um, which told us that uh, the, the patient, the, the B lines that were seen uh, were very unlikely to represent uh, cardiogenic pulmonary and that we had achieved our goal with uh, diuretics. And so uh, diuretics actually were stopped on the basis of this, um, which, um, and then over time, happily, uh, she had improvement and was uh, ultimately discharged. Um, so that was a, a good outcome. Yeah. And uh, so Jay, both of, both, both of these are great studies simply because they show the power of this uh, POCUS AI and your nurses getting the studies. You. Um, you look at these images, and I know that, Shri, uh, that Rohan and, uh, is, is going to point out that uh, in some, in many cases, that the images are reviewed by colleagues that are more knowledgeable in that. Um, in, in that the case here, that you know, while the nurse nurse practitioners are super, and with time could certainly become diagnostic. While we have auto EF is showed here, so you see what the yep. EF is. But you're reviewing these images, aren't you, when they acquire these? Yeah, but not necessarily uh, in exact real time. So the the practitioners are making uh, treatment decisions. Uh, um, and now there uh, there is a physician in the ICU that is also reviewing. You know. Uh, yeah, but you, you you've made the point that they're really super clinicians, so that with knowledge mm -hmm. and some reviewing, because I think that that's really important. And certainly, I'm impressed uh, that they've got you got great studies with good management. Why don't we do this? Um, give us what your takeaways here are, and yeah. then we'll come back in a minute. Yeah, I think that the takeaways from this uh, for me has been that the AI system has allowed uh, training for our nurse practitioners who are echo, essentially echo naive, uh, to allow them to get good quality exams, and that also. The auto, some of the automated features like the AI, but also the uh, little more demonstrate the AI's impression of uh, quality uh, and fidelity gives our practitioners the confidence uh, actually when they're doing the exams to have confidence in the exams that they're doing to then make the clinical uh, right. decisions based on the exams. I think that's been a real power for them, for them as well. That's super. Well, listen, I, I appreciate, you know, you, you all have done, certainly have, have used the technology to continue to do excellent care for your patients and don't go away. We'll, we'll come back in a second. Let's, let's go, uh, Pat, I know you're, you're there and, 
every time I come to you, you disappear. So don't, I'm not coming to you, right? Yet. I'm coming to you a little bit later. If you'll hang in there and you well, can- hope for the best. You can certainly comment. Uh, the so uh, moment that you said welcome and the clock hit noon, there must have been 50 million people that uh, logged on to Zoom because it just knocked me right off. I'm sorry. I'm but sorry. I'm on my phone now. So. Okay. Well, you come. You're, you're, you're okay. So, so Judy, as I mentioned, is a neurologist, a neurointensivist, uh, certainly a futurist, if you would. So, Judy, tell us a little bit about how you've leveraged the capabilities of AI in the neurocritical unit. And I know you have no disclosures. Absolutely. Thank case. you. Yeah, that sounds great. So this is a case that we had in the neuro ICU about three weeks ago. It's an 82 year old woman who came into the ED for syncope and shortness of breath. And while she was in the ED, she actually developed a left MCA syndrome. So she had a right, she had severe aphasia, right-sided weakness, right-sided field cut, um, visual field cut. And she was very neurologically um, ill. And so this is just an image. The first head CT is just to show the large clot that's actually in her left middle cerebral artery. And then the other two images are just a pre and post um, angiogram when we took the clot out. And she actually went back to her neurologic baseline, which was completely normal. So for us, the next step was obviously to work up the etiology of her stroke. Um, and that night in the neuro ICU, my PA Jenny, who has done about zero ultrasounds, um, captured these images using uh, you know, caption guidance. And from this image, you can see that she has impaired systolic function with extensive, you know, ventricular apical regional wall motion abnormalities, indicative of an apical infarct or even stress cardiomyopathy. And from these images, we were able to suspect that her stroke was most likely cardioembolic from probably a mural thrombus. And also her point of care ultrasound shows that she has this large pleural fusion. I mean, she had huge pleural fusions and we started diuresing her immediately that night. Um, and also a great function was, you know, her EF was 32% um, based off of caption AI guidance. And in the final TTE actually showed that the EF was 25 to 30%. Um, so just excellent. Next slide. And, and Judy, you, you had yes. mentioned that it would have taken you a little while to get a formal echo done up there. So that being exactly. able to deploy this immediately with Jenny uh, was really useful. For sure. We normally, it takes us about three to five days to actually get a formal echo on our stroke patients. Mm -hmm. So this Maybe was, three. yeah. Shriek raised his eyebrows. Shriek, can you do a portable surface up there? <laughs> no, I know, but unfortunately that is true in, in busy yeah. places. So. Let's, uh, let's talk about, Judy, I'm sorry, I, go ahead and continue, focus on the neurointensive uh, critical errors. Absolutely. So, you know, that was just one case that demonstrated how we use point of care ultrasound in, in neurocritical care. And the, the next series of images is really just to establish how much the brain and the heart are connected. And this is just a picture showing that, you know, um, intracranial ather atherosclerosis, and we have a lot of patients that have cardiovascular disease because of the same risk factors, you know, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia that cause a lot of our um, neurologic uh, diseases as well. And if you'll just click to the next image, there's also just a neurocardiac access. So when you have severe um, brain injury, like a TBI, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you have a catecholamine surge, um, we have seen a lot of stress cardiomyopathies. They can even kick off MIs and STEMIs, et cetera. So just uh, next image. This is a picture of a patient actually who has a subarachnoid hemorrhage in the unit. And it's highly associated with Takasubo's cardiomyopathy, which is what you can see in, in A, you have apical ballooning, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. So this is just to go through kind of how we've actually utilized Caption AI in our own unit. Um, first, you have just a quick orientation. That's really all it takes. And this is Jenny doing, you know, using Mike from, from uh, the company who is serving as our model. And she is teaching other PAs just very quickly. How do you use the software? How do you use the ultrasound machine? And then, you know, our residents and PAs are very quickly able to use to follow the prescriptive guidance and obtain really quality images. And then next, and then we just bring it to patient care. So right straight to bedside. Um, this is another PA, Jess Wiggins, who's had no echo training and she's using it on one of our patients who actually has uh, was, had sepsis and we were able to um, diagnose that based off of this. So it leads me to my next slide, which is really just the future directions in neurocritical care. Um, 
you know, POCUS is something that we're using at the bedside every day. All of our patients have many indications for point of care ultrasound. This is again, an, an echo that one of our PAs did yesterday um, that shows a stress cardiomyopathy in a subarachnoid hemorrhage patient. And so using the software within our unit, we've been able to take, um, you know, this software and AI guidance into kind of like our bedside decision-making 24 seven. It's been excellent. Our, our teams really loved it. And it's really made a difference in patient care. And you, Judy, you had mentioned to us, and I think it might be interesting for Pat to hear that, that basically the neurologists and neurointensivists, not only in the country, but around the world are really um, paying a lot of attention to using POCUS in their units, not to exclude full echo studies, but just because of the immediacy, being able to do it at night or on the weekends, things like that. 100%. We're really utilizing it as a field. It's growing. And there's been a need more and more at our national conferences, et cetera, to have point of care ultrasound training. And so a lot of a lot more of my neurocritical care colleagues are, are using point of care ultrasound. Super. Well, I, I appreciate it and know and the excellent care that I know you and your colleagues give to the patients in the uh, Wild Cornell neurocritical thing. Rohan, can we, Judy said you can send her questions. That's a uh, you're, you're, you're a brave doctor there to put your, <laughs> your email out, but that's great. So anyhow, we'll put that. Rowan, can you, we want to get Pat in in, a, in, a, in just a few minutes, but can you take us through how you've used it in periop anesthesia quickly? Sure. Um, so after having, you know, tremendous success with uh, the machine learning software uh, during the height of the COVID pandemic here in New York City, um, we implemented um, Caption AI um, in the pre anesthesia evaluation clinic uh, developed a protocol to have novice ultrasound users image two subgroups of patients uh, with the Caption AI system. The first group being those uh, with a documented COVID 19 positive test, um, given the unknown long term cardiac sequelae of the disease, which is being investigated by, by many groups uh, around the world. And the second group being patients with uh, chronic cardiac disease scheduled for intermediate to high risk surgery um, who may have not had an indicated follow-up TTE prior to their procedure because of the pandemic's uh, disruption to clinical services. And, uh, and next slide, please. Yeah, I will, but you, you mentioned, I think it's yep. important is your, your pre-op anesthesia clinic is not in the hospital. You don't have echo services readily available there. You'd have to send patients back to the hospital, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, our our pre-op clinic is, is across the street uh, from the main hospital and, and doesn't have, um, uh, doesn't share, uh, it's not in the same building as, as, as the Echo Lab. So, so that would require a, a, separate, a separate appointment. I know you got a lot of examples, but tell us uh, about this patient. Yeah, this, this was an interesting case, uh, an 85 uh, years old woman who, who came to the, the pre-anesthesia evaluation clinic for pre-op labs and EKG um, the day before um, undergoing an, an urgent splenectomy and pancreatectomy for cancer. And in the clinic, she complained of uh, feeling lightheaded and having um, low blood pressures at home. Her cardiologist recently cut back on um, her three to four antihypertensive medications. Um, and given this information, an, an anesthesiology resident in the clinic um, novice user uh, did a, a limited TTE using the, the Caption AI system. And as you can see, the findings um, are, kind of, are consistent with marked LVH, very thick uh, ventricular walls uh, with a small cavity size and, and a high hyperdynamic function. Um, we, we passed along uh, this information, the findings uh, to the anesthesia team the next day. And they were able to um, address her, her preload dependent left ventricle with fluids and treating the uh, hemodynamic lability she experienced uh, during the case. She was quite labile in the beginning, uh, requiring um, kind of a moderate to high dose of a phenylephrine infusion. But after we showed them the images, uh, they kind of understood the physiology better and, and were able to uh, provide a, a, a appropriate fluid resuscitation. Yeah, so that I mean that's that's a that's a great example of how knowing that in advance certainly could lead them to doing the right things, not chasing her with pressers and stuff like that. She certainly is has a lot of exactly 
What's Pat? Hang in there. We're going to go to. to uh, I, I'm, I don't know. If you want to make a quick comment about using? Um, you know, you saw both Judy using it in a neuro ICU, and I know you all have got big, big ones in Northwestern and also in the pre-op uh, anesthesia, non-cardiac. Um, your thoughts? So I, I just think it's really fascinating how this has evolved. Um, you know, I've been aware of this since Bay Labs when there was really a focus on cardiac echocardiography and now it's caption health. And so we're finding all these new use cases in point of care ultrasound. And I suspect that a year and two years from now, we're going to have a lot more, but it's really sort of exploded. It was that we were just going to use it for plain old echocardiograms. But I think that, you know, with the lung findings that we saw and COVID patients and thinking about it as part of the workup for stroke patients and pre-op clinics. We're just seeing applications in a lot of areas that we had not anticipated three or four years ago. So really interesting stuff. Uh, that's that's great. We'll come to you as uh, we're going to get as Shriek to talk us through a little bit uh, about value-based care and how they're beginning to use it in their cardiology clinics again off out of hospital. Remember, this is part of the out of the hospital experience where you might not have echo available uh, immediately. Shriek, you don't have yep. any disclosures, so I think that's good. You've got the map of the United States is stretched out. It, it, <laughs> you look like you're from Texas. You made this, <laughs> the, that's the country big there. I like yeah. it. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Randy. So I, just a little bit of background. We've, we've heard from a number of different individuals on, on the webinar today. And for those who don't know, Duke is in North Carolina and, um, you know, relative to many other places is, is fairly rural. Um, next uh, slide, Randy. And just to give you some sense, when we're talking about this in the outpatient arena, many of our patients come, we're a referral center from anywhere from 15 minutes to eight hours away. So Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina, West Virginia, Virginia. And as I mentioned, they're coming for things like AFib, VT ablations, transplant, structural heart disease, so on and so forth. Next slide. And so we, we actually face a number of kind of unique challenges to a rural location, which is um, number one, you know, all we have clinics spread out sort of all over the place and not all of those clinics have uh, echo available in those clinics. And as I mentioned, the patients are coming from significant distances and so they often don't want to show up first thing in the morning. And they also don't want to leave really late and be driving at night up the mountains into West Virginia or into uh, Tennessee. So they really like to be here sometime between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And so there's a lot of these kind of add-on echoes. So we do most of our business in a really crunched period of time as far as echoes go. And it's difficult to actually do that because of pre-authorization requirements, et cetera. So I'm going to go through a case um, of where uh, POCUS and, and Caption AI came in very helpful. So this was a 65 year old female um, who presented with three days of chest pain. Um, she's got diabetes, she has dermatomyositis, she has a history of non-obstructive coronary disease, and at least as of five years ago, had a preserved uh, EF. And so she's coming to one of these clinics where we don't have echo services and complaining of ongoing chest pain. So her EKG has some kind of non-specific ST T wave changes. And here's the problem that I, I faced. So it, she's here on this map in the top sort of uh, section of it at our uh, facility, and she needs to go down to where the red dot is to be able to get an echo. And uh, yeah, go ahead and advance it. She needs to cross and get onto this road, and it's 90 degrees outside. And by the way, she doesn't have any um, transportation. I'm not making this up. Um, so the question is, I have a patient with chest pain in front of me. What am I going to do here? So um, we actually use POCUS, and this is, this is take, taken with the caption device by a, uh, by a very new fellow at the time uh, who didn't have any formal training yet in ECHO. And so what you can see uh, on the left is a parasternal image, um, but really want to point your um, eyes to the image on the right. It's a four-chamber, a foreshortened four-chamber view. And you can see there's a, um, an apical wall motion abnormality here, basically, where she's got a deep decreased uh, um, wall motion at the apex. And in the setting of someone who's presenting now with uh, chest discomfort um, that's ongoing, this is pretty concerning. So we actually ended up, um, you know, calling an ambulance and sending her to the uh, to the hospital via ambulance, and and she ended up having a catheterization and was in fact having an end STEMI. So this was a situation where you know we we didn't have a great way of assessing her um, through our traditional means, and and point of care ultrasound and the caption device became very very useful. 
So we've actually yeah. kind of um, since that time gone gone several steps further um, in trying to implement this in a in a um, ordered way in our outpatient clinics. And so what we have here is we actually have um, the ability for providers to do a point of care ultrasound uh, echo, and we use a CPT 99308, which is a limited exam CPT. And so then the provider, if they are able to uh, answer their question, which is typically EF or pericardial effusion or IVC size, um, and they don't find any incidental findings as they do that, then they bill that 99308 within their own clinic note. Actually, we have a smart phrase that they fill out uh, some drop downs and it generates a bill on the back end within their clinic note. On the other hand, if they actually um, find an incidental finding or their indication is um, incompletely assessed per their, um, per their opinion, then they can go on to order a full echo, which of course entails the issues I've talked about in terms of another appointment at a different location. And we've built it such that the full um, uh, echo CPT code will, will replace the, uh, the limited code. And this is that drop uh, down uh, sort of dot phrase that we've implemented in the, in the clinic notes which has a limited number of um, indications that we're using this for and really kind of a pre-populated uh, report that providers can just choose from in, ter in terms of LVEF ranges, effusions, yes or no, IVC sizes and incidental findings. So this is, can be done fairly quickly in the process of clinic where we, we know we're spending seven to 10 minutes uh, per patient, including all of this. And this really matters because um, we're really in North Carolina, especially transitioning to value-based care. Uh, there are about 10 million people in North Carolina. In the next couple of years, about 6 million of them will be covered by value-based care, which, which is basically, for those who don't know, a capitation type of system where uh, an insurance company would pay a healthcare provider X amount of dollars at the beginning of the year and say, take care of this patient and don't come back till next year uh, for any more money. And so that really changes the incentives to be able to provide high quality care at the lowest resource use. And here you can just see kind of a comparison in terms of the incentives between our traditional fee-for-service care versus this value-based care. Uh, next slide, Randy. And so if we wanna provide high quality care um, with lower resource use, there's two ways of doing that. One is to say, well, we're just gonna do fewer echoes. Um, and the other way is to say, well, we need to do the same number of echoes, but we need to do it more efficiently. efficiently. And really, there's not gonna be a situation where we do fewer echoes. You just heard all the other speakers talk about how very useful this technology is. So we need to find a way to do it more efficiently. And this is just our trend in our own lab in terms of the number of echoes that we're doing, which is mirrored nationally. And so to do it more efficiently, we have to get away from our current paradigm. The current paradigm is physician has some sort of question. They put in an order for a standard old echo. We pull out the $200,000 machine and we do 100 images and we give them a report three to five days later, as you heard from Judy. Um, and next slide, Randy. We really need to get to something like this, where we right size the imaging. So for certain focused indications, which is what we're doing in our outpatient clinics, well, we can do POCUS right then and there, get an answer and move on. And yes, if we have incidental findings or we haven't gotten the question answered, Sure, we can pull out the $200,000 machine and do the, the full 50 to 100 uh, image study. And that's really what we've uh, tried to implement here in our outpatient clinic. Next slide. So really in summary, the timeliness of care with POCUS and with the caption device, especially in settings where you either don't have full echo available or you're constrained uh, by resource use in the way that I've described for our patient population, uh, that, that can be a real advantage to integrating POCUS there with the appropriate guidance. And implementation, implementation in clinics really requires an integration into the workflow. We're seeing patients in seven to 10 minutes. This has got to be quick and part of the, the existing workflow. And we can really use it to right size you know, echocardiography, especially as these challenges of value-based uh, care are approaching us. Great. Do you see, and I'm going to go to Pat in just one second. Do you see this... Um, uh, moving out of, you know, further out. In other words, I talked about specialty clinics, specialty care, you could home care, things like that, because you really, your resident was not trained, but you certainly, you know, we've talked yeah. about you using APPs uh, in clinic. Right. You see that happening? Yeah. So we actually want to, the way we've integrated, I just happen to have a resident with me. We want to integrate it so that our APPs and NPs are the ones doing this. 
and potentially even into our medicine clinics, which are just a floor above us, also, again, in a building with no echo services. Great. Okay, we're going to come back. Pat, don't leave me now, baby. Don't leave me. <laughs> don't leave me. Hopefully, we'll, hopefully Zoom okay. won't throw well, we me gotta, out. We got to we gotta, we gotta move along, so I'm going to be your driver. I will. I'm going to watch. <laughs> You so know, um, no, I'm tell me about the, to, your, card of your Center for Artificial Intelligence and how you did this. Sure. So about two years ago, we formed this uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence and Cardiovascular Disease within the Bloom uh, CD Institute. Uh, and we did it because uh, we were starting to see more and more technologies that actually look like they're applicable today and they're not 10 years off. And so this was one of them uh, with Bay Labs at the time. So our big focus are in five areas, cardiac imaging uh, as a technology incubator, electronic health record using natural language processing, uh, clinical trials using AI technology, and then also computational biology. So one of the first projects that we did was with uh, this ECHO technologies and the current stethoscope is over 200 years old. It just had a birthday a couple of years ago. Um, and it really varies depending on who is listening to it. I was generous in saying that the published accuracy to detect AS murmurs is 50 to 70 percent. It's down to 30 percent in some of the studies. So uh, ECHO is working on a digital stethoscope. You can also look at the EKG. And so we did this P-valve trial. And so uh, with Jim Thomas, I think we put about 600 patients into this trial so far. And so if you look at the uh, ROC curve on the bottom, uh, sensitivity 97.2%, specificity of 86.4 for aortic stenosis, that's really remarkable. And in 2019, American Society of ECHO won the award. So then um, we also were looking at, okay, the physicians speak medical and Latin, but the people that are actually doing this speak in algorithms. And so we wanted to create a training program. And so we created a fellowship along with the uh, engineering school and computer science up at the Northwestern campus. And so we have now three trainees and they are focused on coming up with a variety of different studies. So uh, these are our three. Uh, and then you're looking at computer algorithms for EKG. Randy, is your finger stuck on this thing? <laughs> and then- uh, no, but I, no, and then no, but the clock is. <laughs> I gather. So, um, but what I'm gonna talk about next is, uh, you can go to the COVID thank, one. Thank you, thank you, Matt. So, um, you know, COVID has caused us all to make a lot of changes. And so using AI, it's actually really kind of accelerated our use of it. Next slide now, Randy. So this is an example. Ramsey Webby is one of our uh, fellows that is in this. And so as COVID began, he applied his knowledge of AI training. Uh, again, sort of pivoting like we've seen throughout many of these presentations. And look at the accuracy of detection of picking up COVID on chest x-rays. It's equal to radiology experts uh, who do CT scans and all for a living. So uh, just like we've seen new use cases um, for caption health, this is new use cases for AI. Our experience with caption goes back for years when it was Bay Lab. The SHAPE trial was uh, the first uh, sort of a pilot trial of about 20, um, uh, the nurses that actually put you in the room uh, and take your blood pressure and so on. And so we piloted it with that group and actually had good results, but it was the very early phase of the technology and then uh, participated quite a few patients into the pivotal trial. That manuscript is coming out. Next slide. You, you, the pivotal, yeah, you pointed about the pivotal. The thing about the pivotal is it, it was a trial designed with the FDA and it was the basis for which the FDA granted the the um, the guidance, um, the first and really made it the first and only current uh, automated guidance system. And it had the quality uh, indicator in there. So your, your nurses and nurses at MHI were really critical to doing that study. Not only did not only did the FDA approve it, but they approved it super fast in a in a pathway that is right. meant to help speed technology to the bedside. So um, we actually begun buying commercial uh, systems, and so our first four 
um, we're going to deploy in various areas like in uh, critical care. Um, we have been using it for COVID patients as you've seen, uh, but also in the emergency room, hospital medicine and cardio-oncology clinic. And I think the message that what we learned from this is that, um, and what you've seen earlier is that these are not things that we had anticipated. These are just, we have the technology and then we found different ways that we could use it. So this isn't driverless cars. I thought I'd have one taking me around by now, 10 years ago, but uh, I'm still waiting. Uh, this one actually is here and now, and we really need to train our, uh, our colleagues, our younger colleagues and how to actually do this. Um, and then I think natural language processing, another branch of AI is gonna be important. And then we want to democratize cardiac screening. As uh, you just heard from Shriek, um, you know, these are the type of technologies that we want to extend across to areas that don't have access to a really high quality echo lab and to use uh, point of care ultrasound in a lot of different areas. Thanks. Okay, super, Randy. Super I'm Pat. Finished. You know, okay. it's, if this was a rodeo, you just uh, rope the calf in under ten, and get a, you, get, you get a you get a you get a high score in that. So uh, let me let me do this. I want to just tell us where we've been, and then I want to get get uh, Judy or Jay or Rohan uh, Shriek certainly to jump in. But we've we've seen how COVID has definitely changed healthcare, and the, the areas I think. Uh, healthcare providers are going to be more empowered to do more. I think that's justifiable. Uh, point of care ultrasound is reaching a prominence. Uh, the new technology, AI enabled technology, certainly will play a critical role. And we, for those of you in the Echo Labs, there's nobody that's been had more friends and more close friends and better friends and sonographers. We're not putting anybody out of business. This is really just enabling those frontline caregivers in the middle of the night on weekends and outpatient settings, maybe in home to be able to acquire images that are of diagnostic quality. They can be, will be auto interpreted in some cases, or they can be by telehealth uh, interpreted at distance. And so this is really expanding the power of ultrasound to where it can help many. And I think that's important. And I think you've seen from the case demonstration that, uh, that AI enabled POCUS really can change the course uh, any comment, uh, Shriek, uh, Rohan, Judy, Jay, any comments you want to make? Yeah, I would just, Randy, to, to your comment about, you know, whether this is going to increase or decrease echoes. I, I actually think this is, A, most importantly, as you pointed out, it extends the reach of the technology, which is clear that that's a need. And B, I actually think it's in that way increases uh, use. So I don't, you know, in my role as a, a lab director, I, I don't view this as a threat. I view this as an extender and as a tool. Right. And Jay, what's been the response of your nurses? Um, I'm sure that they felt empowered. I know that in, in the nurses at, at, at Northwestern, they really loved being able to learn, you know, be able to acquire echoes. They'd heard about them. So what, what were your nurses' thoughts? Yeah, that's absolutely the case. It gives them a you know, a, another tool, uh, a reliable tool that they they have uh, at the bedside. And um, in, in COVID, it, it once again, reaching areas, you know, the COVID ICU is an area where a lot of times the formal echo machine doesn't want to go because it's more difficult to clean, more exposure uh, for a formal echocardiogram, a longer time, you know, at the, at the COVID patient's bedside, whereas the focus you can be in and out presumably in you know five minutes so less exposure to the operator so right. I, I think that's been very welcome from the uh, echo labs side but to the main point i think it is very empowering to the, right. the frontline providers so uh, judy i you know when i saw those images that jenny did or first or second ever i told you i'm gonna make her a fellow of the american society of echo those look like dynamite images but so uh, i mean jenny's a pa she's uh, on nights and weekends and things what what have been your your caregivers thoughts in the in your neuro icu absolutely the the pas from the neuro icu have been using it i mean we've had this you know, machine and software in our unit for about four or five weeks, we've done over 30 
um, point of care ultrasounds now. So we are using it at bedside. We are making these acute decisions. I agree, it's not decreasing the amount of echoes that we order. We still order formal echoes, but this is for the a patient's acutely hypotensive, they're febrile. Is it a stress cardiomyopathy or is it sepsis? For a big question for us. And you know, we can get so many images, and I think that RPAs have been able to utilize this so quickly um, and capture really great quality echoes. So it's been awesome. Right. It's actually Super. extending into our step down unit as well. The neurosurgery PAs want to get involved and step down PAs want to get involved. So it's great. Super. Super. Listen, thanks to all the panelists. If, if the only thing we're lacking is three more people and then we could have done it and fast forward talking, but this has been great, great information. I, you all are all taking care of so many patients. I appreciate it. And for the audience, thank you for joining. Uh, you can reach out to us and we're going to look at questions and answer those individually. Uh, panelists, thanks so much, and you all have a good rest of your day. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you.